Hello, everyone. This is Manolo Concepcion. I am the new associate head coach at Eastern Illinois University here in the United States. I am born and raised in Puerto Rico, uh, but have coached there at all levels, including professionally, men's and women's. Um, I've coached here in USA in junior college and NCAA Division I. When this crisis started, um, I wanted to begin um, an educational journey where we could gather information from all around the world, talking to different people from different communities um, about the game that we all love, you know, learning from their background and experiences. Um, so it has been an amazing opportunity for, for all of us to, to make sure that we stay open to new ideas, to new philosophies, and most of all, knowing that we can all think different and have the same goal at the same time, which is continuing to learn how to learn. Um, so again, I'm, I'm really grateful for the support that everyone has shown so far. Um, please go and like and follow the page called Bali Junkies. So that way you can see this and other presentations that we have had. You can go into the video section and you can see every single session that we can we have had so far in the past couple of months um, today i am honored and privileged um, to have one of the great coaches mr steph antiga saludos steph hello steph how are you good hello everyone um first of all you know i i wanted i wanted to tell to everyone that is watching that um if you feel that this conversation should be in Spanish, please let us know. Uh, because we're trying to reach as many people around the world, we're doing it um, in English. But if you need any specific translation in any specific moment, or you need Steph to speak Spanish in a specific moment, please let us know. He speaks five languages uh, perfectly. So um, again, I'm honored uh, to have this opportunity, Steph. And I want to ask, um, what country are you right now and how are things going? Uh, I am in Poland, in Jeshu. So this is a city I was coaching this year. Uh, I was coaching girls for the first time. And so I was locked down with my family in Jeshu. And how are things there with this pandemic? You know, what's the process, uh, you know, in that side of the world right now? Uh, well, in Poland, it, it's okay. Uh, we are locked down pretty early, much, much earlier than many European countries. Uh, and actually, I think there are less than 1,000 uh, people who died because of the virus, the COVID-19. So it's okay. Let's say it's under control. So now restaurants opened again. So this is pretty nice. People are living normally, finally with masks and so on, but means going outside and, you know, uh, so this is nice. This is nice. What are you doing to like stay busy? You know, you have been so used to be on the move all the time, you know, coaching one team, you know, and planning and organizing. Um, and now with this social distance, uh, how are you staying updated? Well, the beginning was difficult, you know, when uh, we stopped the season uh, suddenly and we had some dreams to win the championship, so finally we couldn't. Uh, we are second for just one point, so it was some kind of mourning. Um, and then, well, I spent time with family, we made some board games, was reading, uh, making some sport home. And, and speaking with, with friends, also something very nice, uh, uh, speaking with different coaches about volleyball, about our method, our te techniques, philosophy, and, and actually, so spending nice time with, with people from volleyball and, and learning, which is, which is very important. So, uh, well, it was an initiative from, from Daniel Castellani, so great coach from Argentina. And uh, so a good friend of mine, he was my coach during two years in Poland. And well, so yeah, once per week we are, we are, we are speaking about, about our, our patient. By the way, I know that Daniel is watching right now. So my best to him. I appreciate uh, his support to this project. And, uh, 
you know, and again, grateful to have all of you guys in the program. Um, Steph, you did not start uh, in volleyball just as a coach. You were one of the best players in the world at some point. Can you tell me a little bit about that, about your, about your best experiences and maybe the biggest influencers in your progress as a player? Uh, yeah. So I started, I started volleyball when I was 18, so pretty late. Previously, I was playing tennis. And, uh, well, I switched like that. Just I was, I was not improving anymore, so I, I just wanted to to try something different. So um, I started in Paris. Uh, I was a middle blocker, then a right side, and finally, finally uh, a receiver. And uh, well, I, I spent all my career in France in Paris. A pretty successful year where uh, we won uh, many titles in, in France and, uh, and we won also the Champions League. And then I could play in Italy, in Spain, and in Poland. So in Poland, I finished my career. I played seven years, and um, and well. So also I played 13 years with with national team, and uh, well, yeah. You so were I think you were definitely someone that um, you know one of the most complete players on your time. You know, it's someone that could do it all, um, probably because of the background that you established. You play many positions, but also, you know, the ability to have four and five different shots, Steph. Um, tell me about that skill acquisition. How, how did that happen? Like, what, you know, you started so late in the game. Who was responsible for all this? And what type of training did you do to make sure that you stay this, you know, in this type of quality of player? Well, I think... So I think really tennis helps to, uh, even if I started pretty late, you know, playing tennis, even if I was not, you know, a professional, I had pretty good level and it was enough, you know, to, to work on my, on my footwork, on, uh, on trajectory readings and on tactical uh, also aspects. So, uh, and I could see then, I, I saw some tennis players, you know, able to play, pretty well volleyball. So I think it's, first of all, it's a, it's a good sport. And I wanted my, my, my kids, my both kids to, to start with, with tennis. Uh, and then they decided to quit after, after a few years, but I was happy about that because I think it's a really good sport to develop children. Just it's not a, a team sport, but, but for, for many reasons, it develops many skills. Uh, and then I think that, well, I was not a physical player. I had to to develop different different weapons. So, uh, well, I think that's the reason. And then playing with with good players and taking inspiration from them, and also means I, I was lucky to meet many many very good coaches. So, you know, this background is I think is important. Steph, I have a failed uh, a failed attempt to go into the French Open last year. Actually, around this time, um, I don't know why. I actually went in shorts, Steph, in shorts and a t-shirt, and trying to get into the French Open, uh, one of the most important uh, events in the world. But uh, but yeah, no, definitely tennis. Um, very famous sport, very athletic sport. It requires a lot of dynamic movements, and that's something that. Um, you characterize yourself as uh, someone dynamic, uh, someone that could, you know, the offshot that you had, especially to that zone four, and then you have like a crossbody line shot. Um, talk to me a little bit about your eye sequence, your reading skills. Um, what did you know that we didn't know at that time, Steph? And how do you train those reading skills? Uh, well, about... Well, no, I tried to, as I told you, because I was not a, a physical player, so I try, I try very early to, to use the block when I was spiking to score. So I was not able to spike over the block or, or, or to spike so strong. So using tips and then using the block to score, like, yeah, especially on the line, uh, playing faster also was something important. So when I started, uh, I try. I try with my different setters to play always faster, um, and then well, trying. I remember when one of my 
um, maybe my mentor is Glenn Hogue, and uh, so he was our coach in uh, in Paris. So means it, it was important for me to to, to get this this kind of coach to, to reach higher level. And I remember he was elaborating a strategy for each player, you know, what you need to work on physically, tactically, technically. And, and then I remember that step by step, you know, I could, I could improve and, 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 and be a, a better player. So uh, I remember I was, I was internal. So for me, it was very difficult to score. Uh, spiking diagonal from position four when when I had a good middle or good libero in defense. So uh, so I remember about all all the process, you know, to to become more more performant in spike. But the same for each for each element, you know, this is working hard, learning to be to be better all the time. And you were actually spiking the the pie between positions before it, it became oh, yeah. so, and it was a quick right. one, difficult to read. Uh, you already came with your hand up. You no, know, you were all about the shot, locating, and then high hand. So, oh, you know, yeah. I think that those Good. elements. Uh, yeah, you remember? I'd say it was maybe my favorite. You know, my favorite sp spike. So, this is a ball that we don't see so much now. Right. Also because, yeah, it, it couldn't be so efficient like it was. I think the main reason is uh, because now blockers are helping much better. Mm. So with middle, we shoot, but also with pipe. So, you know, this pipe between, between right side and middle blocker, right mm. in the interval was very good also. I could adjust the last step, you know, to cut to, to, to the diagonal. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, was, it was pretty new in that time. Uh, I think it was in, in 2000 when we started to, to play a lot in the national team. And, and it was working very well. So now... I'm not surprised that nobody's playing anymore just because the block is too strong now. So wow, you're so you right. You won't have the same, the same efficiency, the same effect. Yeah, and then since bunch reading became kind of like the universal blocking formation in the highest level, um, now it's, it, it hasn't been used much. You know, it, it is being used, for example, by USA, but in a first tempo, you know, right after the middle. Um, but not as much as the way that you establish it, that is more a location type of swing um, in between yeah. positions because of that, because the right side tend to lean more towards its player in the outside, but now everyone is just punch reading. Um, yeah. as, have any of these elements been brought to your coaching? You know, what, what has influenced you, you know, from being a player um, to now being a coach? Because... The transition of being one of the best players in the world to then, you know, going into coaching, do you think it was going to be easier or more difficult than it was? Hard, hard to answer. I think it's, it's helpful, but, but maybe it represents like 10 or 20% of the job. Uh, and, and then, you know, you need to think differently. This is, um, I, I learned a lot speaking with with the coaches i i, I worked with and uh, yeah and then trying to remember what was successful with each coach i worked with you know this process for me was very important okay. uh, to understand you know the team building the strategy uh and uh, yeah as i told you i met i met different uh, very good coaches and uh this is why I, I could I could improve so much, and and then I didn't want to make a copy paste, you know, <laughs> but just trying to take inspiration from from uh, from uh, from from them, and and then to build my own my own philosophy, my own uh, thought. And um, now this is the fact that I, I was I was a player helped me to 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 understand how. How player thinks, you know, when he's packing or after a mistake, or when it's really hard during during a period where we we overload. So, you know, I I know I know what the when players think. I know what they can when they can say in the locker room. I know their frustration when they are not playing. So, it helps to understand, and it could be very important, you know, to manage a, a group of people. You need to understand also what what the different feeling 
feelings. And uh, so I think, yeah, that's, um, that's helpful somehow. Interesting that, you know, that you say that you have a little bit of every coach, of course, that have, that have coached you. Um, Steph, in the beginning of your coaching career, what, what were some mistakes that you made that you try, like you say, you try to copy something from a coach that you really like, but then you figure out that within your own personality wasn't a good fit. Were there any things that you remember that you're like, why did I do this? Because I have so many memories of me as a coach of things that I did, of how I was coached, I was like, oh man, no, bad choices. <laughs> how about you? Like, do you have those moments where you think back and say, why did I do that? Well, in the very beginning, so yeah, of course, I, I don't remember, but I made many, many mistakes, maybe. Uh, not always important, but uh, yes. Right now I'm thinking that I wanted to speak Polish absolutely with Tim and and I think it was not necessary. I think it was necessary for, for fans, for federation, but not for players. So, and finally, I was not clear. I remember when I was explaining the trainings and, and I was not clear. So I was not speaking good enough for it to, uh, to be clear and say, well, no, no, it doesn't work. It's you know, most important to be clear. So then I, w I was keeping working as Polish, but I wanted to be sure to, to be understood and, and also to transmit my emotions. Because this is a problem sometimes. It's not that difficult to be understood when you, when you speak a different, a different language because more or less, you know, using some basic words, so it's okay, but, but transmit your emotions. So this is also important. So, and this is why something it could, be, it could be a limit. And then I remember the first game I played with Poland, so I just forgot to, uh, to say the squad, you know, the starting six or so starting seven. So, uh, well... Yeah, many, many small things, you know. Um, and then, you know, I had several months uh, to, to prepare myself. I was, still, I was still playing in Poland, so in, in Skra Berhatov. And uh, I had several months. I remember the, uh, I was wondering which kind of coach I will be. And then finally I said, well, I played with more than 50% of the players I will, I will coach. So... <laughs> uh, it's it's impossible for me to to switch like that. To, you know, I cannot play a, play a, go, a role. I, otherwise, you know, I I need to be the same person. You know, with with my method, with my message, with my, but uh, finally, you know, uh, I I kept I kept staying myself. Mm. And uh, so maybe it could be different if I will I will start coaching a team where I. I don't know anybody. So, but the fact that I knew I knew most of the players in the national team, so I said, no, no, I need to be myself. Steph, um, just making it apart here. Um, they're watching us from Israel, Hungary, Mexico, Puerto Rico, the U.S., of course, India, yeah. um, Argentina. And yeah, so, so, you know, hello everyone that is watching out there. I appreciate the support uh, going on right now. Um, Steph, going, going in, that, in that same subject, so do you think that one of your biggest discoveries as a coach was knowing what you didn't know, recognizing this is, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses? Because I found like in the beginning of my coaching that that was the most difficult thing, that I thought that I knew stuff that I did not. Yeah. that I only knew it by theory, but I haven't tried it yet. Um, yeah. So that was the kind of like the beginning of me learning how to learn. Do you feel that that was, you know, that that's the same case with you? Yeah, no, it's, it's complicated to, to coach. It's much more complicated than to, to be a player. Uh, yeah, I, I remember, you know, sometimes I tried to apply uh, some methods, some exercises, some, some drills and, and it was not working and it was, you know, I just spoke with a coach and, and he convinced me to, <laughs> to, 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 to use something and, 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 you know, the same after a suc successful season, for example, you know, uh, you're questioning yourself, say, okay, so that worked very well. That was the key of success. And the next season, it doesn't work so well. So it just because, because you need to adapt to, to your team every time. So I think it's something. 
I heard that previously and uh, and it's so true you know yes some some basics are very important but then you need to add that to to your group to your team on time and and for that you need to know your people very well on the other side of that what has been what have been your keys of success since the beginning of your coaching till now what have been consistent on you that you feel that you know that you have been put in great situations uh in your career and that people keep you know trying to to find a way you know to get you to be their coach what's what is what Steph Antiga brings to a table? I have no. I think the best would be to, to ask my players. That would be the best. That's uh, you know. No, I think I, I'm I'm still I'm still hungry. I still want to to work hard and, and to keep learning and 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 I'm still questioning myself. So I think this is the most important. Uh, then when when I can maybe. I, I want I want my team always to play a nice volleyball. So this seems something important. I want, you know, I, I like to work on each element, obviously. But uh, I, I spend time to develop some skills to make my team playing well, playing smart, playing well. So it means also, you know, spending time for everyone to develop a, a strategy and and uh, yeah, an individual strategy. It could be to serve, to spy, uh, or setting. So this is something important for me. I, you know, so you know well that it's so frustrating for a coach to to wait for the final result. So this is, and usually this is like that that journalists and fans will judge you, will judge you as a coach. Uh, <laughs> but there are many many satisfactions, um, and like like the you know improvement of each player. This is nice. Uh, I remember when I was in Paris, so we had several su successful seasons. And so my coach from Canada, Glenn Hogue, uh, was there. And so I remember one season we won four titles. So two European titles and two national titles. So I think maybe we, we lost maybe one game this season. And I remember at the end, we had a nice party, a nice celebration with all the team. I remember our coach, was thinking a lot about the, the development, development of each player, especially young players. And I don't remember, maybe they didn't play, maybe they didn't, almost they didn't play all season, but he was so proud of them because, because they, uh, you know, they were, they learned a lot and they improved a lot. And we just met something incredible, you know, in, the, in, in volleyball history, it was the only time. And, and he was speaking about, about that. He was so proud of that, that the young players improved so much. And, and then I could understand just a few years later when I became a coach, because, <laughs> because it's so true, you know? Uh, you need some satisfaction tools like this one. And is that how you define winning now, you know, with the type of development that you, did, you do with your players? That's my number one question. And then number two, What's your okay, team? Could you repeat, please? Could you repeat, please? Yeah. Um, can, has that been something that, that uh, of how you define winning, um, Steph? You know, that if Coach Hoke uh, helped you define winning like that, like developing your players and by consequence getting the victories, is that something that you implement in your own teams? And then number two, I want to ask you, uh, how, how does your teaching methods look like? Okay, uh, so yes, so this experience with, with Paris and with Glenn Hogue, yes, so was very useful uh, for me. I tried to, you know, to elaborate a plan uh, for everyone and to, you know, to, to try to develop each player. So, and then means participating to that with all staff. Because sometimes you need to work on, on physical skills first, and then you will work on, on different, different skills. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes it could be also some therapy to solve a, uh, to solve a, a knee issue, for example. So uh, I want all my staff to be involved in that process. Um, and then, well, what are my methods to uh, to teach? Uh, what kind of teacher are I, you? Like, are you someone? Yeah. So I I, I really believe that uh, having fun is a very nice way to learn. So I try to uh, 
to make some, uh, yeah, to, to give some fun during warm up. Uh, also, you know, I invite the players to provocate and to, to challenge each other. So it was it was important for me as a player, and you know, it's, I know it's not easy for everyone to to be serious, working hard, and having the fun at the same time. But for the players able to do that, it's it's a really good way, you know. Uh, to be always motivated, to be happy, to go everyone uh, every day to the to the gym, and uh, and well, this pleasure, this this happiness to work together, to improve together, this is something beautiful, you know. When when you reach it, uh, so this is something something very nice, and and um, well, it, it 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 I think it, even after only one season working with women. Uh, I think I can say it's, it's the same for men and women, you know. Uh, and it builds it builds a very nice team atmosphere, a nice chemistry, uh, which is also very important. Talk to me a lot about feedback. Um, you know, what what do you think are the keys for us as coaches uh, to provide effective feedback? Um, and has that changed with you throughout the years? Uh, and now that you're coaching a different gender, are you approaching feedback differently? Well, yeah, feedback are important. And in general, communication is very important. And this is so often that when you take feedbacks from, from your team after a certain period or at the end of the season, usually there were, even if everything was nice, and usually there, there is a lack of communication or some, you know, some moments. And, and the next season, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that I will spend even more time to communicate. I will repeat. I will, I will you know, I, I, I want to be sure that everything will be clear. And, and so, and I'm speaking with coaches. So we know, we know perfectly how important is communication. And, and I encourage player also to ask when it's not clear because this is a problem sometimes for a coach it's clear you know but if it's not for some players so it means <laughs> it's not good enough so it's better also to ask and and to individually because in front of of all the team you know sometimes it's not comfortable for for a player to say oh sorry coach i i didn't catch it Steph, and that oh. has changed, right? That has changed since you were a player in terms of uh, how feedback was provided to, you know, in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, it yeah. was more like in your face, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, in front of everyone, <laughs> sending a message. Now it's mm -hmm. really individual. Do you think it's because science is now more involved in the game and understanding how learning works? Or maybe. what do you attribute that to? No, maybe, maybe, I don't know. That's, I don't know. And then, well, there is also something. What to do with feedbacks? Because sometimes, you know, you think about the feedback and say, no, it doesn't make sense. Or things. <laughs> and sometimes it's true. So this is very nice when you have several feedbacks. I will give you an example. When you ask to your, to your players how they feel, you know, and, and if you have them, they will answer that, well, we are very tired, you know. but. But if they had a party the night before, so what to do with, with, with those feedbacks, you know? So this is an extreme example, maybe, but, uh, you know, you, you need to take some feedbacks, you, you need to take it in consideration, and that you need to, you know, uh, I don't know what, uh, you need to, not to, to, to take everything, you know, to, uh, you need to evaluate the meaning and the sense of, of, of each feedback, which is, which is not easy. How much of you is feel versus analyze? You know, like well, what, what matters to you more, you know, in the times of a match, in the times of planning? Um, you know, I, I, how much do you trust those numbers versus how much do you trust your feelings? Well, it's... I like numbers, I like statistics, but it's difficult to say, like 60% analyze, and no, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, for sure, it's a combination, you know. Uh, and more, more you know your team, more you can use your, 
your your instinct your mm -hmm. uh, this is so in the beginning it's like, more numbers driven stuff and then when you start getting to know them yeah. it's more feeling an, an example when you know you are starting bad a game and you have for example one player uh, one of your key players not starting well and you know in spike in reception just not playing good but you can see, you can see on her, on his face, on her face, that she's still into the game, you know. And he just maybe she she hadn't a successful start, but maybe because the opponent played well, hmm. so maybe just just a bad choice. But and sometimes when you know well your team, you know well each player, you have many information, you know, on the body language, on face, and on the eyes, and and sometimes even you know. After four bad reception, four bad spikes. So if you have somebody you trust on the bench, so theoretically, it's a good moment to make a substitution, no? But but if you know that player very well and you can see that she's still or he's still into the game, so you will be more patient. So this is this is yeah an example, and it's the same. If after one two mistake, but if you see your player completely down, you know. Like you, you, you can observe him that he lost self confidence, so it's not needed to to wait more to to use this substitution. So and it's yeah, it's the same, it's the same when you you prepare uh, an opponent. You know when you prepare the game plan and and the opponent setter, you know him very well because you are studying him very well for years, and you know what he will play. You have this feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. And and something even if on that volley on the statistics, you know, usually if he calls shoot, he will play shoot over. So you know, you know in that moment what you will do, and you communicate with your blocker. So this is a kind of of instinct of uh, uh, yeah, you need you need to trust in, in in this kind of moment. You of course as a pro league coach, um, and then coaching different national teams. I have a question for you. Do you adapt that feedback to depending on the culture and background of the player? So like Canada, different of talking to a player from Poland um, or this is who you are, Steph, and they adapt to you. How, how does that work in your team? <clears throat> no, it means, yeah, I have my medals, but then, yeah, you adapt to your team so, and to the culture. You're right, this is important. I remember some, yeah, some coaches like Daniel Castellani, Glenn Hogue, they, they really like to understand, you know, the, who, um, not just the player, but the, 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 the people. The and, background. Uh, yeah, of exactly. Yes, family, family and, and the past and the previous coaches, the previous season, previous injuries. And see something also... I didn't. I didn't understand so much uh, previously, and now as a coach, I know when you meant, what they meant. You know, this is you can get many information, and then once you can identify the problem, so you know where to go. You know, you know what to do. You know, so uh, yeah, this is and the same with culture. Uh, so it was easier for me to understand Polish culture because I played there uh, seven years before I started coaching. Uh, and Canada, well, um, I played with many Canadian players, so uh, I knew more or less. But yes, there are some differences. The same with girls. Uh, I adapted my my methods a little bit, my, more my my communication way. Uh, same before the game, for example, in the locker room, I'm not using the same same tools to motivate the team with girls and with men. Interesting. So, tell me about that. Can 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 you get us into your locker room and tell us like, okay, so pre-game you say with men is different than women, like you know, with how you approach it. I mean, uh, well, for yeah, same same job, but yeah, many differences about yeah about communication mainly, and also the fact that the games are longer, more action, uh, rallies are 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 longer, so it means. On, on physical preparation and and doing practices, so it's a bit different. Um, but yeah, for example, with girls, you know, speaking about aggressiveness, about fight, doesn't work so much. Doesn't work <laughs> so, so well, let's say. Interesting. Um, so well, yeah, I could see, you know, 
this is a kind of mistakes I made or kind of taste, let's say, mistake in Norman. Uh, during the first time I used, you know, this kind of, of, of words uh, before the game or during the game, you know, try to motivate them and speaking about fight. Uh, well, I could see that the relations <laughs> were not great like, like with men. So, well, I, I started to, to, to sing differently and... And yeah, there was no reaction when you talk about that, but maybe... Yeah, not you know, the same reaction. So. Yeah, present it more as teamwork and uh, what they can do together in those long rallies, in transition and all that. And, exactly. Um, and speaking about that, I, uh, does your training also change? Like now that you're planning for women, um, does your training uh, composition changes as well from gender? Um, what's important to you in men and what's important to you in women in terms of practice composition? Pretty, pretty same. The only thing is uh, uh, I developed a few things like uh, I, I, I modified the, the, the starting and the position in defense. You know, I don't want uh, any defender into the three meter behind the block on the line in five or in one. So I want... I want the, the same position that we made, maybe half meter uh, closer to the net, but not, 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 not much. Same for position six, staying in the center, or moving a bit to the diagonal, but not, not moving to the line. Uh, and then, well, no, we worked also a lot on, on blocking skills, helping a lot, and, uh, and it's something that I like to... Uh, to work a lot on, on block and uh, and I, I, I kept doing the same with girls and actually we had very good season blocking so uh, also working on fingers because usually women doesn't like so much to, to use fingers in reception even setting um, so something we we work pretty much and some of some of them we are using uh, very well also uh, what else working on, on pancakes so <laughs> <laughs> maybe more than with men because maybe more girls needed to uh, uh, to, to work on that. Uh, and well, so yeah. your, do your numbers, you know, now that you're pushing people in, um, which it's also done, of course, here in the NCAA a lot with women's volleyball, um, you know, with five and one and then putting in the, the middle back, basically in the middle, middle, in the middle of the back row. Um, have you found bigger tendencies of attackers going more towards the middle of the court, including with block touches, uh, Steph, in women? Yeah, means means yeah. There are some differences in block. I think it's really possible to to do the same. The only thing is it means helping helping a lot and 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 moving fast with. Uh, means especially from middle blockers. Uh, the differences in block are uh, maybe the speed of the set to, to the opposite back row. So this, is, this, this makes the main difference. And, and also the fact that it's not necessary to commit with middle. Um, not big one, okay. On the, highest, on the higher level, yes. But with men, it's more often that you need, you know, you need to to commit to decide earlier and to to really commit with middle to get a chance to block and to to stop them with girl much less so it makes it, it makes easier uh, the game plan and, and so it means it's more important even to to read well and um, well also not so many block out that bounce bounce so far behind the the back line. Mm -hmm. uh, the more blockouts okay. that you can play and basically extend your exactly. play in transition exactly. and all that. Um, so are you working a lot in transition um, in your practices, Steph, in your training? Like, are you working on footwork? Are you working on eye work, you know, and reading between offense and hitter? And how do you do it? Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. We, with men, about, yeah, the footwork. So I use, I use a lot of video to, to 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 correct and uh, you know all all the weak points could be with footwork with hands position so I really consider that it's a very nice tool so it could be sometimes on the court with streaming or otherwise after practice sending my feedbacks uh, to players so uh, I get always good results sometimes you know so often as a player 
you have a perception, a wrong perception of, of your hands in the air uh, or, or, your, or, the, or your footwork. And, you know, you are sure that your hands are straight, but they are, they are not, you know. So with video, you can, you can really identify your problem and, and understand better what the coach just say because, oh, yeah, it's true. So, you know, um, and well, yeah, I like to work on, on technique, you know, uh, usually not so much in the morning. Uh, we used to make one, one single long training, but more with groups. So work, for example, with middles in the beginning with setters and, and working on, on different, uh, different uh, moves, uh, come shoot back, for example, shoot over, uh, react with middle, go to position four, you know, this kind of stuff, and then transfer uh, to, to, to the practice, to the six and six, um, and same with, with setters, with, with right side receiver. So not always the same group, just working on different stuff, but with a small group of players. So I really like that. And it's not always, you know, very intensive, very exhausting. It's more about, about repetition, about, about spending time with small, uh, with few players to, to, to work on a, a certain element. So basically you like to work on, you know, in small groups to increase learning, um, increase the amount of uh, effective repetition. That way you can provide feedback more specifically to less yeah. players at the same time. And they can probably make corrections a little better that, that can help with skill acquisition, uh, that can help with the, you know, with the increase of learning rate as well for each individual. Um, tell me, is there any specific position that you dedicate the most time to, um, and then why? Uh, I have the feeling that no, but when I speak with, for example, my, my staff, my previous staff, uh, for them, I'm obsessed with block. So this is mm -hmm. their world, you know? Uh, so I guess it's true. Maybe in comparison with other coaches, <laughs> I think I spend more time. Uh, you know, I, and I pay more attention to, to block. Uh, but then I try, you know, I try to, to give time and, and to, to, to everyone and to all, all fields, all, all technical elements. We're talking to Steph Antiga, um, the star player and coach, um, the coaches internationally, the pro league level and national team level that has coached as well. Um, say, I'm saying hi to people that are watching from all over the world, including Belgium, Colombia now, Germany, um, the U.S., um, Canada, um, Hungary, um, and all other places. So I appreciate the support that you're giving to this educational project. Hey, Steph, um, what type of um, of learning lessons you took from your experience with Canada, you know, your experience with the other national teams that you have been on. Um, what are the biggest lessons for you that you're now working on? Uh, no, with, with Canada, that was a very nice experience, especially after, after Poland, where in Poland, you know, volleyball is extremely popular uh, for years because I think it started when when Poland won the World Championship for the first time in, in 74, I think, and, and it was against the uh, Soviet Union. So, you know, extremely important for the country. And so um, there you have very good conditions, very good training conditions. And so not, not just in clubs, you know, where the league is strong, but also for federation, and, uh, the national center is beautiful. You have everything you want to work well. And then when I work in Canada, so that's different. It's a public gym where, you know, you cannot train, you cannot practice whenever you want. You need to train when it's possible to, when you get, when you get the court. So not always two courts, uh, sometimes no court at all. But what was very nice was to, you know, the culture, because they were over-motivated and, and never complaining about the conditions about you know the same the traveling conditions about you no know, just working hard all the time and just just wanted to to be better so it could be at nine in the morning uh 
So, and this is also no, very nice. Also, the fact that they were, you know, very well educated in terms of like, mm. the, the gym was always clean at the end of training. Uh, the guys, everyone uh, catching the balls uh, during training, uh, you know, organizing the court with the net and so on. So, you know, this is a nice culture. And I think also this is because of what did Glenn hold for four years there mm. and together with the culture. But I think this is good to, you know, it's something I want also now uh, with my teams. It's from the beginning, I want to, uh, I want that culture that, you respect your gym, you respect your, your team, so yes, the gym will be clean and, and, uh, and you will help uh, the staff to, you know, to, move, to put the preventive staff on the court and, and to, to take the balls and so on. So this is, this is nice. And also, Steph, but they're so important because it, it teaches everyone the value of the work that is being done. So it's not just, you know about the etiquette, but no, yeah, you're so right about those small details. Uh, you know, yeah, but you know, sometimes in Italy, in Poland, where you have so many staff members, usually it's players that don't, they don't, they don't pick, pick up the balls, you know, they just, <laughs> when there is a break, so just, just sit and drink. And well, it's, it's like that. There is no, no even discussion about that. And, but I think it's, it's for everyone, just. And, uh, and I like that. And it's not just a question of, of how many staff members I'm to the team and so how many guys could, could pick up the balls. No, it's just everyone is doing the same and, and helping each other all the time. And this is what we want also during the game when one player will have some, some difficulties and it's still on the, on the court. Well, we want, we want everyone to be able to help, to help him. You strike me as someone very humanistic. Very organic, very, someone that cares about, you know, the true self of each person on the team. Um, is, this, is, a, is this a way that you were raised, Steph, you know, that you're bringing now this to volleyball? And can, for everyone watching us around the world, why is it so important, um, you know, to, to build a program this way? Because beyond the volleyball part, beyond the technique, the tactics, um, you strike me as someone that likes to bring that to the table of your own programs. Why is this so important and how did it start? It? Uh, well, it started because, yeah, I saw, I met some people, I told you, some, some coaches, some players like that. And I think it's just maybe not the most important. This is not a key of success, but just it's important to be good people. And, uh, well, so just, I think it's, I want, I want my team to be like that, that just that. Perfect. Um, okay, so let's go back into the technique and tactical part of the game. Um, your training, um, how well, how much before do you plan your year, uh, Steph? And does it stay the way that you plan it? Like the whole periodization of your year, and then how do you build those micro cycles? So those weekly sessions of yours? Hoping that the, you know, that the pandemic ends, you know, how would you yeah. do it in a normal situation? So, first of all, uh, looking at the skill and, and trying to evaluate how difficult will be each game. And then setting some priorities. So, when we need to be at 100%. Uh, so, then I combine the quantity, the volume uh, on the court together with the load uh, in fitness mm -hmm. and so obviously speaking with my with my physical coach about that and and then the same with the micro cycle so uh, if I don't need necessarily to be fresh on the game to win uh, so first I need my team to understand that we'll be tired so that's why we are working well um, and then well uh, you know, so there are some tools, you know, to measure the quantity of jumps, uh, also the feedbacks. We, we spoke about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's more, more than that. Also, the intensity, it's something, uh, again, so speaking with coaches, you know, uh, yeah, I learned also how to, how to play with an intensity and to, to decrease it. Uh, before the game, before the important games, 
So, well, it's pretty nice. And then about the tactical point, tactical aspect, this is also related to, to the next opponent. And if the most important game will be in two or three weeks, so during training, we will already work on, on, the, on what will be, you know, needed to win against this team, against, you know, a strong opponent. So even, I, even if you're playing opponents before that, you're thinking exactly. about what's the most important opponent ahead. Exactly. So this year, for example, our, our main opponent uh, was Polizze, and, and so they, they finished first. And so, but it's several weeks before the game against them. So we are already working on some tactical situation, you know, very fast set uh, to position four, for example, the direction from some spikers. Uh, so some tendency like that. And, uh, and well, so it makes, it makes my trainings, my practices a little bit different every time because I try to, to provide a content according to the next opening so uh and it could be you know i would if we have a blocking a blocking team uh next saturday so uh, i will put some restriction and to work on coverage and and to put accent on coverage also you know uh, working on individual strategy to 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 play with block to be more passionate to to avoid to be blocked um so well yeah different ways to and, and so it means if if we start uh, the cycle on Monday, so from Monday I start analyzing the next opponent because I want already to to know what I have to work mm. to be prepared uh, uh, for the game. Quick question before we dive into that tactical part: You mentioned about decreasing intensity right before a big match. Um, do you also decrease volume, or you increase volume? Uh, with less intensity, or do you decrease volume and then raise intensity before a big match? Like, what's the combination of those two elements on your training right before? Uh, yeah, usually I, I try to, to keep intensity uh, for maybe 15, 20 minutes. So it's before a big game, you know, a very important game. And also, also the volume will be, will be lower. Uh, if it's not so important, so we can train two hours and a half before the game, the day before the game, uh, against important game, uh, against important opponents. So maybe it will be one or forty minutes, no less. Uh, mm -hmm. But but also with low lower intensity. Uh, also, the day before the game, I don't use you know contracts and I don't I don't count points. I don't give any penalty. Also, you know, I want, if I see that my team, my team is already stressed and, you know, into the game, so I don't, I won't add any pressure and I want, I would try to, to work on self-confidence more. Uh, Interesting. Than, Interesting. Yeah. So, beginning of the weeks, then you're competing, you're putting scoring, you're putting like more watch drills, six versus six, get it created, yeah, attention. As you get closer to competition, then it's just, you just want them playing. You want them feeling relaxed, comfortable, and confident right before that match, correct? Yeah. Okay. How about fitness? Are you working fitness on game day or not? Uh, it's um, optional, let's say. For, so it could be, it could be uh, obligatory. Uh, when, when really that game, it's not the priority, and we need to make fitness that day to be in a good shape, in a great shape for the next game. So, in this situation, yeah, we'll do fitness, or it happened also to make fitness right after the game uh, to work on uh, more on hypertrophy and preventive stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, so usually we don't. So we'll make two or three fitnesses uh, usually usually two and uh, also with girls i'm working uh, mainly on strengths um so maybe not not so much like with men but we are we are we are still on, on strengths and uh well girls we are feeling we are feeling well feeling well 
Again, uh, we're talking to Stefan Tiga. Uh, I appreciate everyone that is watching from around the world. Um, I'm, I want to ask you that in terms of you, not, you in the pro league, do you have any time to, or do you actually like working on any aerobic base before you get very anaerobic to, throughout the year? Steph, like how's, how's the design um, of your training throughout the year? You know, you, you, sometimes you get players right in the middle of the season. Um, so like, how do you deal with that subject specifically? Uh, no, I don't. Yes, during preseason, yes. Uh, so guys or girls are running and and cycling, uh, but not so much. Then we we'll work on the court. That will be, you know, aerobic. Aerobic on the court could be working on technique. Could be playing, uh, playing some games with with small groups, or then you know playing six and six and and just with three four uh, balls. And then, well, you know, we walk one minute and a half, two minutes, and uh, and almost, you know, just few seconds break. So, on aerobic, I, I walk just on the court during season. If I have an injured player and not able to practice, so yes, we'll walk differently, especially on on bicycle. Uh, if it's a knee problem or ankle problem, um, but yeah, you know, I. I, I don't consider that so so important if you if you can work you know with six and six uh, mm -hmm. really you can you can you can work very well. To stretch or not to stretch? <laughs> stretch. I'm not. I was not fanatic of stretching as a player, <laughs> so I was not an example about that. Did you stretch uh, at all, Steph? Did you yeah, stretch but, at all? Uh, no, I read I read some articles <laughs> about that, and it seems that. Well, so for me, many players they used to they used to stretch, so they feel better. It's some kind of routine, and well, they feel good with that. So let's stretch. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay, so let's talk about tactical stuff. Talk to me about scouting. Um, in terms of you know your week is starting um, until when you're only talking about your own team. Um, and then when does the next process about analyzing the opponent along with your player start? So, yeah, so uh, analyzing opponents obviously is very important. I, I like it. I, it's necessary. And, and, uh, and when also analyzing my own team all the time, you know, may, so first of all, watching the last game, but also after a couple of games, you know, checking the statistics and, and observing the evolution in reception, in spike, in serve, and then individually as well. So I'm making the same work uh, also because I want to, just I want to know maybe how the next opponent will play against us, mm. what kind of weaknesses he will find, and try to anticipate this uh, strategy. And then, and then, well, and the most important in during season, uh, what I told previously to everyone, I try to, to give some goals and 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 we try to reach some goals in serve, uh, block, spike, and, you know, so where it's easy to to have some uh, some numbers and to uh, and and to, yeah to 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 see the evolution during the season or season after season when you keep the same players. So yeah, so this is this is very nice. Uh, I like that. It's your scouting based mainly on the setter or the attacker tendencies or on Both. rotation patterns. Both. No, sometimes. No, it's you, you need to know to understand each spiker, and this is what I'm trying to do when when I I'm 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 presenting the video session. You know, I'm explaining the game plan. I try to explain. Like trying to tell a story about a setter, about a spiker, what he likes to do in that situation. I try to 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 understand that sometimes this is logical. So you know, is internal. So uh, you know, middle blocker not so important to 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 block him because it's pretty easy or it's making is not efficient spiking diagonal. So let's focus on other players. You know. 
trying to, to give some explanation about, about the opponents. And uh, I think it's better and it's easier to, to memorize and to remember during the game under pressure once you, you understood, when you know why you started playing like that, because he, have, he has maybe some, uh, some tendencies, some weaknesses, some technical uh, yeah, weaknesses. So once you understand, so you, you, you remember all time. You don't have to remember, oh, P3, okay, so P3, if the reception is coming from five, no, 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 it's just you try to memorize so many information that doesn't work, in my opinion. So it's better simple. to... Simple, simple. Yeah, simple, but you can, even if it's simple, logical, you can give more information once, you know, it's, it's also logical for, for blockers. Mm. You said blocking is really important to you. Is your blocking formation usually on read or are you more into assigning um, now in women's volleyball? You know, now, now in women's volleyball, like what are you, what are your preferences in that regard? So uh, reading, reading a lot during training, reading and uh, almost means I don't want my players to commit during, to make some option during training because this is the most important and the most difficult to, uh, to work on. And yeah, but during the game, using some options, some tactical options, not necessary middles, not always middles. Could be some, uh, you know, wing, spike, uh, wing blockers as well. Uh, but yes, using uh, much less with girls because of what we mentioned, but still when there is a fast, uh, when middle blocker is spiking back, on, on one leg, one foot, so it's going very fast. So it's very difficult for middle, even a very good middle, you know, to be on both sides. So this is why, you know, you need to, to make some choices. And, and well, this is also part of our job to, to make them understand that it's useful to make some choices. And, and that means that we'll make always the right choice and to accept that. So this is also important part of, of, of building a strategy uh, to, to convince a player. Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, it's okay. No, I was going to ask you, like, based on your research and your experiences, how do you approach blocking the slide? It continues to be such an effective attack um, in women's volleyball. Blocking, um, I, did, I didn't understand. Blocking Blocking, what? blocking the slide. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, how do you approach the situation with your blockers? Um, okay. You know, what, what are the strategies that you use usually against a dominant slide hitter? And what are things that you have discovered that are the keys to be a good slide blocker? So, one difference with men is usually when, when opposite is back. Or, so, with men, I want in my left side to be with setter. When the reception was perfect, you know, uh, to, to block spike or, or, or dump. So with girls, I want my middle to be with the, with the setter. So this is maybe the main difference. And then, yeah, when, when, it's, when the setter plays, you know, very fast ball uh, be, be behind to, to the middle, so this fast, or to position four. So as I told previously, it's almost impossible to you know, to block both, so mm -hmm. just will, I want my middle to go and then uh, middle, they get this information before the game, then means, doesn't mean that we'll play like that all the game, but we'll start like that. And I want my middle to have one priority. So fast or position, position four. Mm -hmm. And this is according to, to the efficiency, to the distribution and also to our strengths in block and defense. If I have a strong blocker, so I would prefer my middle to go to the other way. Uh, and the same, if I have a middle in defense in five, sometimes middles are not the best defenders. So uh, I would prefer my middle blocking to go to the spiker spiking to five. So, uh, well, so this is, yeah. Uh, related to, to strengths and weaknesses of our opponent and our team. 
a, a blocking a gap go a 31 or seven uh type of set you know with a with a go with a quick ball to the outside any strategies are you using at that high level um for women's volleyball that ha have continued to work for you we talk about reading you know how important it is but more into footwork and handwork um what are things that are working for you against that type of formation so i work on the same way that with men and uh, so this is adapt quickly the starting position for middle uh to not face the the go or the shoot or 31 mm -hmm. uh just to be closer to it and be able to to react and then once we see opponent setter setting in front so it could be in that moment could be 31 or position four is the start moving and shuffle so i don't want my meters to to cross in that situation i want them to shuffle and uh, and maybe they won't be so high reacting with 31 but you know high enough to, to to control or even to block but then they could be on both it means jumping the first time with 31 so with opponent's meter and then if the setter is setting over to position four be able to bounce and to block again mm -hmm. so this is a technique that uh i use and and i got i got a good results uh, with with men and women and same for uh for right side so more for for opposite than for setter depend on setter uh i had Brizard in in warsaw uh he, he's a setter but very physical and not just physical also reading very well and and very fast very high so he was helping with we shoot very well and still helping he was able to uh, to block well uh, on wing so it depends of the of the skills uh of the correct characteristics of your of your blockers uh and then it will be the same with 51 back so it's the same with left side mm -hmm. um, so usually i don't want my middle to follow because i want my left side to help more mm. uh, but the same you know using more lateral steps than crossing in that situation when when my blockers don't have to help with middle with pipe or with setter so i want them to cross to be more aggressive to be higher and maybe you can be a little bit lower uh, not lower little bit uh, sorry less precise crossing but you know with you know high aggressiveness and uh, and and perfect penetration so ready to aggress the spiker where have you seen the biggest tendency uh, against blockouts you know what what what's your recipe to try to at least minimize this element into the game well uh usually i don't know i, I I consider that uh, we we have to be under thirty five percent blockout. Mm. So uh, well, so technique technique is very important. Uh, so and then the timing, timing also uh, position of hands, how far from the tape you are, um, and and then you know make your fingers strong strong. Work on shoulders also to not breaking. Uh, you know, sometimes you can see some some blockers. They are in good position, but probably core or, or shoulders are too weak and mm -hmm. and they are breaking. So also, when we identify this kind of problem, so we are working uh, very early in the season on 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 building strength on shoulders and fingers, and uh, and well. Also, when it's too fast, so sometimes I ask my meters to not try to block because maybe they could block one ball, but they will receive six, seven block out, you know? So I want them to take the tips and, and trust the team, trust the team to, to block with one single block and, and to dig. So... Um, too close or not too close, uh, coach? You, I'm late going into my help. Do I close or do I just stay open and go low and in? Oh, What's... You, one year ago, I will, I will answer not close. <laughs> With girls, I started like that, but some, some girls are, 
are closing well. You know, they are blocking position six uh, pretty well. Uh, so I want them to to float and to close position six when when they are able to still penetrate. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want them to block like that with a passive block. Yeah, so I, I don't like that. And um, even if, again, it's true that not so many blockers in that situation will make a block out far, far away be, behind the, the back line. So that's why with girls, still still early, I need I need one or two more seasons to, to get more information and <laughs> and uh, but in general I would say leave hole. Leave hole. Our left side in six are working hard as well. They are able to to read, to see the seam and, and to defend strong impact. So Steph. Are you teaching that sick off shot that you had to zone three that just kill everyone? Are you are you teaching that to your girls now as well? So oh, difficult girl. to read. You went full swing and then hard stop. Um, yeah, no, it means <laughs> yeah, it's something we we are working on, and then there are you know, but I would say maybe more pushing also with girls. Oh, you're pushing uh, more now. Yeah, then? yeah, pushing more, especially. So in transition, when we play very fast set to position four, especially, or when set is not precise and too close from the net, uh, also to, to recycle the ball, you know, pushing it against the block. Uh, so we are working on, on that also with the timing, you know, to wait and, and to play with the block. So in our team this year, we had a master, uh, Blagojevic, our captain, mm. uh, so from Serbia. So she's playing like, she's pretty good. you know, yeah, you know, she's, she's mastering everything like that. So I encourage her to, to use more and more because it's efficient. It's very uh, difficult for, for block and defense to, to adapt uh, to, different, to different shots. And, and then, you know, I spoke about inspiration, but it's so great to get somebody every day like that using these kind of, of skills. So... So my other players, they can, they can learn from them. And then obviously we'll, we'll elaborate, we'll set up some, some, some drills uh, to work on that with, for example, with a block on the table. So to make these kind of tips, work on, on block out on the line, you know. So sometimes I could give some individual challenges also to, to, to some girls or, or some, some guys. Like, uh, for example, one day I will tell them, oh, today you need to score three times using the tips you know these kind of individual challenges uh to to force them to use different different uh shots not just a strong one diagonal which is the most uh, common uh, and yeah also coach but your players are like earning you know are, they're earning a lot of money going there into your team why should i be trying this what that stefan tiga is telling me to do it could cost me my contract how do you manage that uh, that element about making mistakes you know what it's okay to make mistakes in my practice it's okay to try it in the game um <laughs> you're still going to going to succeed you know what are you doing to make sure that they go through that learning process anyway uh well usually it's better when it's natural you know when when you you can see that everyone is motivated because everyone wants to be better so this is the best way it's not a way like that it means it's not a way like that in all elements like for example not all players consider that defense is so important that a <laughs> block is so important or yeah. coverage is so important so it has to come from the coach if it's not natural. And then, well, inviting players, each player to be better. And, and how to be better? Well, working on your technique, working on your strategy, using more shots, uh, respecting the game plan. So working on your, on your mind to, you know, to, to maintain uh, concentration, attention. Uh, so it's, I also believe that you know, cooperating with players. So uh, I try to not being a, a policeman all the time. I, I prefer, you know, collaborating with my team and, and invite us, invite, invite them to, to try something different, uh, to work on something, to help more and more. So even if it's too much, usually I, I ask them to, 
do more, more until, until I will say, no, now it's too much, you know, but I want them to, especially with girls. Again, it's my first year, but it seems that, uh, you know, you need to repeat more to girls to, to try something that means maybe we need to be patient because it will mm. take time, but I encourage them. Uh, and then uh, this is more with, you know, technical trainings uh, or the first part of the training. And then the second part when we are, um, you know, playing, uh, we are counting points with, with some contract, with some penalties. So I want them to be efficient, like during the game. But uh, mm. I always try to keep, to keep some time and, 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 and provide some situation to, to work on, on something new or to work on weaknesses. Um, so Yeah, so for, for them to be able to be comfortable knowing yeah. that, hey, and, you're and not on your own. When, when they just made a mistake in something new, something coming from me because I wanted them to work on that. So I keep trying to encourage them. Hmm. Big part of blocking, you know, big part of a great blocking team is usually they are a great serving team. Um, how much do you work on serving and what are things that now you have discovered, you know, you're, you don't have 120, like, no, I'm sorry, but you don't have like 90 mile per hour type of server now. Um, you know, you're in women's volleyball. So like how strategic are you getting into serving and is it important to you? Obviously, serve is very important. Um, and I think every year I'm spending more and more time serving uh, because I realize that, wow, now we, we improve, but not that much. So next year, more, more, and I can see that <laughs> how important is serve. Uh, so, yes, technique as well. Uh, you know, the toss, toss is so important. Also, the, the spot you are jumping behind the back line not so far from the back line. This is also important. So many athletes don't pay attention to that, but mm -hmm. and sometimes some of them, they are jumping one meter far from the back line. It's incredible. It gives so much time to the, to the, yes. to the receivers. Yes. Uh, also the trajectory. So uh, working on that, uh, working on the direction, on the variation. I really believe in, on, uh, on variation. So with men less, uh, with men, we are working on short serve, on hybrid a lot. So for the one serving spin or float, but working on, on hybrid. Um, and uh, not everyone can do that. You need to, to get good ball control. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really deceptive. It's really difficult for a receiver. When especially, the main reason is usually receivers, they don't have the same starting position to receive a float than to receive a spin serve. So once you have the same toss and you want, you work on hybrid, well, you put, you, you put in trouble a, a receiver not able to receive well flood from seven meters. Mm -hmm. So this is that simple, but uh, not easy to master. A good hybrid is not easy to master. With girls, uh, this year I didn't work on that, but I worked on short serve so to get a variation, also get good results. And, and well, with my own, um, my own for, formula, my own tools to evaluate the quality of, of serve. Um, and then, well, mm. self-confidence is also important. This is one of the elements like, like setting, like receiving, uh, where self-confidence is so important. So, and not that easy, you know, to build good self-confidence and to be sure that your team will serve well under pressure. Uh, but no, uh, just, and, and last thing also, you said usually the best blocking team are, are serving well. Uh, so also when you're able to block well, when the opponent is receiving well, so you don't want, you don't want to make so many mistakes. And it's what I expect from my teams to once, you know, we are working, working very well with block defense, because it's always together and, and transition. So I want to limit mistakes, obviously not give the ball to the open and not, you know, not serve with a, with a parable and, you know, so, but, but no, I want to, to, to limit mistakes. I don't want to risk and to, 
uh, to be able you know to win a game just because we risked a lot and and we had a good game no um, so yeah so, you you prefer just consistency more than anything else and yeah. and basically you're approaching you know this side out game from the other side meaning that you're trying to be the opponent with side out trying to keep them in a lower percentage percentage than yours um yeah. You know, with having that serving transition blocking approach, um, how do you sell that to your players? You know, since this is like a side out game, you know, we we spend so much time in offense. I get to Steph Antigua's team, and now he loves defense. He loves serving. He loves you know blocking. Um, how do you uh, how do you yeah, sell no, it to the players? It's uh, this is explaining to the team. How, how we'll be stronger. So, uh, also playing as a team. So, how to play as a team, you know? Uh, so, communicating all the time between also between server and blockers. The same that between blockers, or between blockers and defenders, a lot of communication. And then, well, for everyone, try to be efficient all the time or in serve as well. So, if we have a boy, a girl, not serving so well, so that will be used more tactical serve. Uh, to cancel a spiker, serving short, avoid pipe, avoid middle, and uh, well, try to, to, to find some solution, not just uh, because of, you know, very fast serve, very aggressive, and there is a way to be, to be efficient using different, uh, different skills, different methods. Steph, I am from Puerto Rico, and you coach a Puerto Rican player named Natalia Valentin. You mentioned how you like working with setter hands a lot as well in your gym. What are things that we should expect in my island now that Natalia was working on in your team? Like, what are, what are, what are her new tools that you brought to the table, and what, what's your basic scouting report on Natalia? Well, no, it's, uh, you, should, you should have been inviting Natalia, that would be the best, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so Natalia played in, in developers that season, so uh, she played very well. It was not that easy because she was in the national team, you know, North Sika finished very late, so she arrived after her first game. Uh, she left one month during Christmas time to play the qualification tournament for Olympic Games. So, but, but... She had a great season, well integrated, and she she has so uh, so much positive energy to share with uh, with the team with her teammates. So no, she she she's a short girl, but blocking blocking well because reading well, you know, moving well, hands solid and controlling many balls. Uh, that was hard to help with thirty one, but she was able to to touch some balls sometimes, and she was trying training, uh, defending as a libero and uh, well serving very well short we we won some games because of of uh, very successful short serves and then the most important setting so you know she's uh, she's setting very well she doesn't have any problem transition because she's so fast uh, long side as well she's you know she's strong uh, she's smart so well all the qualities required for a setter so she had everything and and that's why we 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 played very well with with natalia stefan t guys he available to coach any national team right now are you on the market steph <laughs> um, i'm i'm not involved with any national team but means i'm not searching national team uh if a national team is coming to me well i will take it in consideration and and uh, and I will decide then. But uh, Steph, tell people something. how the languages that you speak, please. Uh, well, no. For example, in Poland, with staff, and uh, so we are working in Polish. Um, so then, uh, with team, so I'm speaking in uh, in English. I'm using Italian, Spanish, uh, and then French as well. A few few words in 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 Portuguese, few words in uh, in German, but not not enough to to speak like I'm doing. And in each language, I keep my French accent, so you know, I'm not able to you know to speak with the accent. So this is this is uh, 
uh, for me uh, something I'm not able to 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 to, to speak better. <laughs> Seth, last question: What do you think is the best skill that you have? Well, again, hard to speak about myself. Uh, no, I know. Uh, maybe the best skill is that I really like to win, but I hate to lose. So that motivates me a lot, you know, because I really am in a bad mood after a defeat. So uh, I really don't want to lose for that. So, and then obviously, like everyone, I like to win, but I hate to lose. <laughs> This is Steph Antiga talking to us from Poland. I appreciate the time that you have taken today. I really enjoy this conversation, Steph. Uh, I scheduled this meeting almost like a month ago and I'm really grateful for the, for the opportunity that you brought to us today. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of uh, different approaches to the same game, you know, and, and that's the beauty of this. You know, even with you're, you're different from people that you are always talking to, you know, like Castellani and Astasi and all that. And, and to learn about those differences and still make you successful this way, that teaches us a lot. We can all think differently and we can all anyway get to the same place. So we don't need to be the same way. We don't need to believe on the same things. But as long as we follow learning principles, as, as long as we know what we're talking about, and as long as we know what we don't know, we can continue to be great learners and we can continue to be better teachers. So again, Stefan, Stefano, gracias por la oportunidad y por estar con nosotros en el día de hoy. Thanks so much, man. And um, I wish you health and safety throughout these hard times. And when you come back, I know you're going to be better than ever. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye.